All right. We are um, now recording. Welcome, everyone. This is Elmwood Playhouses, the public domain uh, players, presenting three one acts focusing on the strength and empowerment of women, all written. Plays all written, one act plays, all written between 1904 and 1916. And uh, the three plays that we're going to be doing are The Twelve Pound Look by Sir James M. Barry, Riders of the Sea by mm -hmm. J.M. Singe, and Trifles by Susan Glassbell. Uh, and I, what I'd like to do at this point is to introduce uh, everyone who, all of our actors. Uh, I'm actually going to start with, uh, we, we were going to have um, Carol Napier uh, reading the stage direction. So Carol, if you want to bring on your, thank you. Right. Um, and uh, for uh, the 12 pound look, uh, uh, um, Sir Harry is going to be played by uh, Arthur, if you want to introduce yourself. Arthur? Yes, I'm Arthur Chill, I'm playing Sir Harry. Uh, Luana? Hi there, my name is Luana Riston, I'm playing Lady Sims. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Kelly? Hi, I'm Kelly Kirby and I'm playing Kate. I'm also playing the second woman in Riders to the Sea. And I am Derek Tarson. I didn't introduce myself uh, ahead of time, but I am playing uh, three roles of it. I'm playing Tombs in 12 Pound Look, The Man in Riders to the Sea, and Hale in Trifles. So let's go on and introduce the uh, actors for the second play, Riders to the Sea. <coughs> um, let's start with Mara. Hi, I'm Mara Karg. I'm playing Moria. Um, and Nina? Hi, trying to get my screen up. Nina Leonetti, and I am reading Kathleen. Okay. And Alexa? Hello, I'm Alexa. I'll be playing Nora. Okay. Uh, and Steve? I am Steve Burmack. I'll be playing Bartley. Okay. Um, and uh, then uh, introducing uh, the actors in uh, Trifles. Um, let's start with uh, Debbie. Hi, I'm Debbie Buxbaum. I'm playing Mrs. Hale in Trifles, and I also play the first woman in Riders. And Misty? Hi, Misty Tindilia, and I'm playing Mrs. Peters. Okay. Um, Bruce? Hi, Bruce Pearl, playing George Henderson, the county attorney. And Larry? Hi, uh, Larry Wilbur here. Uh, I am playing the sheriff. Uh, okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, all right. And so uh, without Further ado, I am going to share my screen here um, for this placard. All right. The 12 pound look by J. M. Barry, Sir James M. Barry. The ornamentation of the house is a trifle ostentatious. Harry Sims is to receive the honor of knighthood in a few days, and we discover him in the sumptuous snuggery of his home, rehearsing the ceremony with his wife. Mrs. Sims is wearing her presentation gown. She's seated regally. Her jeweled shoulders proclaim aloud her husband's generosity. She claps her hands as the signal to Harry he enters bowing and with a graceful swerve of the leg. He reaches his wife and going on one knee, raises her hand superbly to his lips. She taps him on the shoulder with a paper knife and says huskily, rise, Sir Harry. He rises, bows, and glides about the room, going on his knees to various articles of furniture and rising from each, rises from each a knight. 
Did that seem all right, eh? I think perfect. But was it dignified? Oh, very. And it will be still more so when you have the sword. The sword will lend it an air. There are really the five moments. The glide, the dip, the kiss, the tap, and to back out a night. It's short, but it is a very beautiful ceremony. Anything you can suggest? No, oh no. You don't think you have practiced till you know what to do almost too well? I do not. Don't talk nonsense. Wait till your opinion is asked for. I'm sorry, Harry. A perfect butler appears and presents a card. The Flora Typewriting Agency. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I telephoned them to send someone. A woman, I suppose, Tombs. Yes, Sir Harry. Uh, show her in and uh, Tombs, strictly speaking, you know I am not Sir Harry till Thursday. Beg pardon, sir, but it is such a satisfaction to us. Ah, they like it downstairs, do they? Especially the ladies, Sir Harry. <laughs> exactly. You can show her in, Tombs. The butler departs. You can tell the woman what she is wanted for, Emmy, while I change. You can tell her the sort of things about me that will come better from you. You heard what Tom said, especially the, the females. And he's right, success. The women like it even better than the men. And rightly, for they share. You share lady sins. Not a woman will see that gown without being sick with envy. I know them. Have all our ladies in to see it. It will make them ill for a week. These sentiments carry him off lightheartedly. Kate is shown in. Good morning, madam. Good morning. Is that a typewriting machine? Yes. I suppose if I am to work here, I may take this hat off. I get on better without it. The hat is already off. Certainly. Um, I ought to apologize for my gown. I am to be presented this week, and I was trying it on. It is beautiful, if I may presume to say so. Yes, it is very beautiful. Sit down, please. I suppose it is some copying you want done. I got no particulars. I was told to come to this address, but that was all. Oh, it is not work for me. It is for my husband. And what he needs is not exactly copying. He wants a number of letters answered, hundreds of them. Letters and telegrams of congratulations. Yes. My husband is a remarkable man. He is about to be knighted. He is about to be knighted for his services, too. For his services. Oh, he can explain it so much better than I can. And I am to answer the congratulations? Yes. It is work I have had some experience of. She proceeds to type. But you can't begin until you know what he wants to say. Only a specimen letter. Won't it be the usual thing? Is there a usual thing? Oh, yes. She continues to type, and Lady Sims, half me mesmerized, gazes at her nimble fingers, and she sighs. How quickly you do it. It must be delightful to be able to do something and do it well. Yes, it is delightful. But excuse me, I don't think that will be any use. My husband wants me to explain to you that his is an exceptional case. He did not try to get this honor in any way. It was a complete surprise to him. That is what I have written. But how could you know? I only guessed. Is that the usual thing? Oh, yes. They don't try to get it? I don't know. That is what we are told to say in the letters. I should explain that my husband is not a man who cares for honors. So long as he does his duty. Yes, I have been putting that in. Have you? 
but he particularly wants it to be known that he would have declined the title if he were not. I've got it here. What have you got? <clears throat> Indeed. I would have asked to be allowed to decline had it not been that I want to please my wife. But how could you know it was that? Is it? Do they all accept it for that reason? That is what we are told to say in the letters. It is quite as if you knew my husband. I assure you I don't even know his name. No, he wouldn't like that. Harry re-enters in his city garments. This is the lady, Harry. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning, my dear. They see each other and their mouths open, but not for words. I have been trying to explain to her. Eh, uh, what? Leave it to me, Emmy. I'll attend to her. Lady Sims goes with a dread fear that somehow she has vexed him. You! Yes, it's funny. The shamelessness of your daring to come here. Believe me, it is not less a surprise to me than it is to you. I was sent here in the ordinary way of business. I was given only the number of the house. I was not told the name. The ordinary way of business. This is what you have fallen to, a typist. Think of it. And after going through worse straits, I'll be bound. Much worse straits. <laughs> My congratulations. Thank you, Harry. Hey, what was that you called me, madam? Isn't it Harry? On oh, my soul, I almost forget. It isn't Harry to you. My name is Sims, if you please. Yes, I had not forgotten that. It was my name too, you see. It was your name till you forfeited the right to bear it. Exactly. I was furious with you here. But on second thoughts, it pleases me. This is a grim justice in this. Tell me. Do you know what you were brought here to do? I have just been learning. You have been made a knight, and I was summoned to answer the messages of congratulation. That's it. That's it. You come on this day as my servant. I, who might have been Lady Sims. And you are her typist instead, and she has four men servants. Oh, I am glad you saw her in a presentation gown. I wonder if she would let me do her washing, Sir Harry? You can go. The mere thought that only a few flights of stairs separates such as you from my innocent children. You have children? Two. Such a nice number. Both boys. Successful in everything. Are they like you, Sir Harry? They are very like me. That's nice. I'm pleased to go. I hope. What shall I say to my employer? That is no affair of mine. What will you say to Lady Sims? I flatter myself that whatever I say, Lady Sims would accept without comment. Still the same, Harry. What do you mean? Only that you have the old confidence in your profound knowledge of the sex. I suppose I know my wife. I suppose so. I was only remembering that you used to think you knew her in the days when I was the lady. Hm. Ah, well, goodbye, Sir Harry. Won't you ring and the four men servants will show me out? Well, as you are here, there is something I want to get out of you. Tell me, who was the man? You never found out. I could never be sure. I thought that would worry you. It is plain that he soon left you. Very soon. As I could have told you. Who is he? It was 14 years ago and cannot matter to any of us now. Kate, tell me, who was he? Better not ask. I do ask. Tell me. It is kinder not to tell you. Then by James, it was one of my own pals, 
Hmm. Was Bernard Roche may have been someone who comes to my house still? Hmm. I think not. Fourteen years. You found my letter that night when you went home. Yes. I propped it against the decanters. I thought you would be sure to see it there. It was a room not unlike this, and the furniture was arranged in the same attractive way. How it all comes back to me. Don't you see me, Harry, in hat and cloak, putting the letter there, taking a last look round, and then stealing out into the night to me? Oh. Him. Hours pass. No sound in the room but the tick-tack of the clock. And then about midnight, you return alone. You take... I wasn't alone. No? Oh. Here have I all these years been conceiving it wrongly. I believe something interesting happened. Something infamily annoying. Do you tell me? We won't get into that. Who was the man? Surely a husband has the right to know with whom his wife bolted. Surely the wife has a right to know how he took it. A fair exchange. You tell me what happened and I will tell you who he was. You will? Hmm. Very well. Forgetting himself, he takes a place beside her on the fire seat. Quite like old times. He moves away from her indignantly. Go on, Harry. Well, as you know, I was dining at the club that night. Yes. Jack Lamb drove me home. Mabbitt Green was with us, and I asked them to come in for a few minutes. Jack Lamb, Mabbitt Green. I think I remember them. Jack was in Parliament. No, 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 that was Mabbitt. They came into the house with me and was it him? Who? Mabbitt. What? The man. What man? Oh no, I thought you said he came into the house with you. It must have been a blind. Well, it wasn't. Go on. Well, they, they came in to finish a talk we had been having at the club. An interesting talk, evidently. Mm, the papers had been full that evening of an elopement of some countess woman with a fiddler. What was her name? Um, Matter? No, 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 no. We have been discussing the thing and, and I had been rather warm. I begin to see. You had been saying it served the husband right that the man who could not look after his wife deserved to lose her. It was one of your favorite subjects. Oh, Harry, say it was that. It may have been something like that. And all the time the letter was there, waiting, and none of you knew except the clock. <laughs> Harry, it is sweet of you to tell me. I forget what I said precisely in the letter. So do I. But I have it still. Do let me see it again. You're welcome to it as a gift. The fateful letter is brought to light from a locked drawer. Yes, this is it, Harry. How you did crumble it. Oh. Dear husband, I call you that for the last time. I am off. I am what you call making a bolt of it. I won't try to excuse myself nor to explain for you would not accept the excuses nor understand the explanation. It will be a little shock to you, but only to your pride. What will astound you is that any woman could be such a fool as to leave such a man as you. I am taking nothing with me that belongs to you. May you be very happy. Your ungrateful Kate. P.S. You need not try to find out who he is. You will try, but you won't succeed. She folds the letter up. I may really have it for my very own. You really may. If you would care for a typed copy. None of your sauce. Kate puts the letter away. I can picture. Let them Jack keep Lamb. it in the end. I can picture Jack Lamb eating it. 
penniless parson's daughter. That is all I was. We searched for the two of you high and low. Private detectives? They couldn't get on the track of you. No. But at last the courts let me serve the papers by advertisement on a man unknown, and I got my freedom. So I saw. And I married again, just as soon as ever I could. They say that is always a compliment to the first wife. I show them. <laughs> you soon let them see that if one woman was a fool, you still had the pick of the basket to choose from. By James, I did. But still you wondered who he was. I suspected everybody, even my pals. I felt like jumping at their throats and crying, it's you. You had been so admirable to me. An instinct told you that I was sure to choose another of the same. I thought it can't be money, so it must be looks, some dolly face. You must have had something wonderful about him to make you willing to give up all that you had with me. Poor Harry. And it couldn't have been going on for, for long, or I would have noticed the change in you. Would you? I knew you so well. You amazing man. So, who was it? Out with it. You are determined to know. Your promise. You gave your word. If I must. I am sorry I promised. There was no one, Harry. If you think you can play me with... I told you that you wouldn't like it. It's unbelievable. I suppose it is, but it is true. Your letter itself gives you the lie. That was intentional. I saw that if the truth were known, you might have a difficulty in getting your freedom. And as I was getting mine, it seemed fair that you should have yours also. So I wrote my goodbye in words that would be taken to mean what you thought they meant. And I knew the law would back you in your opinion. For the law, like you, Harry, has a profound understanding of women. I don't believe you yet. Perhaps that is the best way to take it. It is less unflattering than the truth. But you were the only one. You sufficed. Then what mad impulse? It was no impulse, Harry. I had thought it out for a year. A year? One would think to hear you that, that I hadn't been a good husband to you. You were a good husband, according to your lights. I think so. And a moral man, and chatty, and quite the philanthropist. Or women envy you. How you loved me to be envied. I swallowed you in luxury. That was it. What? How you beamed at me when I sat at the head of your fat dinners in my fat jewelry, surrounded by our fat friends. They weren't so fat. All except those who were so thin. Have you ever noticed, Harry, that many jewels make women either incredibly fat or incredibly thin? I have not. We had all the most interesting society of the day. It wasn't only businessmen. There were politicians, painters, writers. And... Only the glorious, dazzling successes. Oh, the fat talk while we ate too much about who had made a hit and who was slipping back and what the no house cost and the no motor and the gold soup plates and who was to be the no knight. Was anybody getting on better than me? And consequently you. Consequently me. Oh, Harry, you and your sublime religion. My religion? I never always want to talk about a religion, but... Who? Harry, you don't even know what your religion was and is and will be till the day you ex and until the day of your expensive funeral. One's religion is whatever he is most interested in, and yours is success. Ambition. It is the last infirmity of noble minds. Noble minds. You're not saying that you left because of my success. Yes, that was it. I couldn't endure it. If a failure had come now and then, but your success was suffocating me. 
the passionate craving I had to be done with it to find myself among people who had not got on. There are plenty of them. There were none in our set. When they began to go downhill, they rolled out of our sight. I tell you, I am worth a quarter of a million. That is what you are worth to yourself. I'll tell you what you are worth to me. Exactly 12 pounds. For I made up my mind that I could launch myself on the world alone if I first proved my mettle by earning 12 pounds. And as soon as I had earned it, I left you. 12 pounds? That is your value to a woman. She can't make it. She has to stick to you. You valued me at more than that when you married me. I didn't know you then. If, if only you had been a man, Harry. A man? What do you mean by a man? Haven't you heard of them? They are something fine. And every woman is loath to admit to herself that her husband is not one. When she marries, even though she has been a very trivial person, there is in her some vague stirring toward a worthy life, as well as a fear of her capacity for evil. She knows her chance lies in him. If there's something good in him, what is good in her finds it, and they join forces against the base of hearts. So I didn't give you up willingly, Harry. I invented all sorts of theories to explain you. Your hardness, I said it was a fine want of mockishness. Your coarseness, I, I said it goes with strength. Your contempt for the weak, I called it virility. Your want of ideals was clear-sightedness. Your ignoble views of women, I tried to think them funny. Oh, I clung to you to save myself, but I had to let go. You had only the one quality, Harry, success. You had it so strong that it swallowed all the others. How did you earn that 12 pounds? It took me nearly six months, but I earned it fairly. She presses her hand on the typewriter. I learned this. I hired it and taught myself. I got some work through a friend and with my first 12 pounds, I paid for my machine. Then I considered that I was free to go and I went. All this going on in my house while you were living in the lap of luxury? By God, you were determined. By God, I was. How you must have hated me. Not a bit. After I saw that there was a way out, from that hour you amused me, Harry. I was even sorry for you, for I saw that you couldn't help yourself. Success is just a fatal gift. Oh, thank you. Yes. And some of your most successful friends knew it. One or two of them used to look very sad at times, as if they thought they might have come to something if they hadn't got on. The battered crew you live among now, what are they but folk who have tried to succeed and failed. That's it. They try, but they fail. And always we fail. Always. For so, as I say of them, for so they say of me, it keeps us human. That is why I never tire of them. Bah! Kate, I tell you, I'll be worth half a million yet. <sighs> I'm sure you will. You're getting stout, Harry. No, I'm not. What was the name of that fat old fellow who used to fall asleep at our dinner parties? If you mean Sir William Crackley? That was the man. Sir William was to me a perfect picture of the grand success. He got on so well that he was very, very stout. And when he sat on a chair, it was thus, as if he were holding his success together. That is what you are working for, Harry. You will have that and the half million about the same time. Will you please to leave my house? Kate puts on her gloves. But don't let us part in anger. How do you think I am looking, Harry, compared to the dull, inert thing that used to roll around in your padded carriages? I forget what you were like. I'm very sure you never could have held a candle to the present, Lady Sims. That is a picture of her, is it not? In her wedding gown. P 
painted by an RA. A knight? Yes. It is a very pretty face. Acknowledged to be a beauty everywhere. There's a merry look in the eyes and character in the chin. Noted for her wit. All her life before her when that was painted. She's a spiritual face too. Oh, Harry, you brute. Hey, what? That dear Kate creature, capable of becoming a noble wife and mother. She is the spiritless woman of no account that I saw here a few minutes ago. I forgive you for myself, for I escaped. But that poor lost soul, oh, Harry, Harry. Oh, thank you. If ever there was a woman proud of her husband and happy in her married life, that woman is Lady of Sin. I wonder. Then you need to not wonder. If I was a husband, it is my advice to all of them, I would often watch my wife quietly to see whether the 12 pound look was not coming into her eyes. Two boys, did you say? What does that mean? Both like you? I was only thinking that somewhere there are two little girls who when they grow up, the dear, dear pretty girls who are all meant for the men that don't get on. Well, goodbye, Sir Harry. Say first that you're sorry. For what? That you left me. Say you're, you regret it bitterly. You know you do. You have spoiled the day for me. Mm. I am sorry for that, but it is only a pinprick, Harry. I suppose it is a little jarring in the moment of your triumph to find that there is one old friend who does not think you a success. But you will soon forget it. Who cares what a typist thinks? Nobody. A typist at 18 shillings a week. Not a bit of it, Harry. I double that. You magnificent. <laughs> there is a timid knock at the door. May I come in? It is Lady Sims. I won't tell. She is afraid to come into her husband's room without knocking. She is not. Come in, dearest. Lady Sim enters, carrying the sword. Uh, Harry, the sword has come. Oh, all right. But I thought you were so eager, eager to practice with it. Put it down. Lady Sims lays the sword aside. It is a beautiful sword, if I may say so. Yes. Emmy, the one thing your neck needs is more jewels. More? Some rope of pearls. I'll say to it, it's a bagatelle to me. I don't detain you any longer, miss. Thank you. Going already? You have been very quick. The person doesn't suit Emmy. I'm sorry. So am I, madam, but it can't be helped. Goodbye, your ladyship. Goodbye, Sir Harry. She is escorted off the premises by tomes. She seems such a capable woman. I don't like her style at all. Of course you know best. Lord, how she winced when I said I was to give you those ropes of pearls. Did she? I didn't notice. I suppose so. Suppose? Well, surely I know enough about women to know that. Yes, oh yes. Emmy, I know you well, don't I? I can read you like a book, eh? Yes, Harry. What a different existence yours is from that poor lonely wretches. Yes, but she has a very contented face. Oh, all put on. What? I didn't say anything. One would think you envied her. Envied? Oh no! But I thought she looked so alive. It was while she was working the machine. Alive? That's no life. Is it you? It, it is you that are alive. I'm busy, Emmy. He sits at his writing table. I'm sorry. I'll go, Harry. Are they very expensive? What? Those machines. When she has gone, the possible meaning of her question startles him. End of play.
Riders to the Sea, a play in one act by J. M. Singe. An island off the west of Ireland, cottage kitchen with nets, oil skins, spinning wheel, some new boards standing by the wall. Kathleen finishes kneading cake and puts it down in the pot oven by the fire, then wipes her hands and begins to spin at the wheel. Nora, a young girl, puts her head in at the door. Where is she? She's lying down, God help her, and maybe sleeping if she's able. Nora comes in softly and takes a bundle from under her shawl. What is it ha you have? The young priest is after bringing them. It's a shirt and a plain stocking were got off a drowned man in Donegal. Kathleen stops her wheel with a sudden movement and leans out to listen. We're to find out if it's Michael's they are. Sometime herself will be looking out by the sea. How would they be Michael's, Nora? How would he go the length of that way to the far north? The young priest, he says, he's known the like of it. If it's Michael's they are, says he, you can tell herself he's got a clean burial by the grace of God. And if they're not his, let no one say a word about them. But she'll be getting her death, says he, with crying and lamenting. The door with Nor which Nora half closed is blown open by a gust of wind. Did you ask him, would he stop Bartley gone this day with the horses to the Galway Fair? I won't stop him, says he, but let you not be afraid. Herself does be saying prayers half through the night, and the Almighty God won't leave her destitute, says he, with no son living. Is the sea bad by the white rocks, Nora? Midland bad, God help us. There's a great roaring in the west, and it'll be worse it'll be getting when the tides turn to the wind. She goes over to the table with the bundle. Shall I open it now? Maybe she'd wake up on us and come in before we're done. It's a long time will be, and the two of us crying. Nora goes to the inner door and listens. She's moving about on the bed. She'll be coming in a minute. Give me the ladder and I'll put them up in the turtle loft. That way she won't know of them at all. And maybe when the tide turns, she'll be going down to see would he be floating from the east. They put the ladder against the gable of the chimney. Kathleen goes up a few steps and hides the bundle in the turf loft. Maria comes from the inner room. He won't go this day with the wind rising from the south and west. He won't go this day for the young priest will stop him surely. He'll not stop him, mother. I heard Eamon, Simon, and Stephen Feety and Colm Sean saying he would go. Where is he itself? He went down to see there would be another boat sailing in the week, and I'm thinking it won't be long till he's here now, for the tide's turning at the Greenhead and the hooker tacking from the east. I hear someone passing the big stones. He's coming now, and he's in a hurry. Bartley comes in and looks around the room. Where is the bit of new rope, Kathleen? Was bought in Connemara? Give it to him, Nora. It's on a nail by the whiteboards. I hung it up this morning for the pig with the black feet was eating it. Nora gives him a rope. Is that it, Bartley? You do right to leave that rope, Bartley, hanging by the boards. Bartley. It will be wanting in this place, I'm telling you. If Michael is washed up tomorrow morning, or the next morning, or any morning in the week, for it's a deep grave will be him by the grace of God. I've no halter the way I can ride down on the mare, and I must go now quickly. This is the one boat going for two weeks or beyond it, and the fair will be a good fair for horses, I heard them saying below. It's a hard thing they'll be saying below if the body is washed up and there's no man in it to make the coffin. And I, after giving a big price for the finest white boards you'd find in Connemara, how would it be washed up, and we after looking each day for nine days, and a strong wind blowing a while back from the west and south? If it wasn't found itself, that wind is raised in the sea, and there was a star up against the moon, and it rising in the night. If it was a hundred horses, or a thousand horses you had itself, what is the price of a thousand horses against a sun, where there is one sun only? Let you go down each day and see the sheep aren't jumping in on the rye. And if the jobber comes, you can sell the pig with the black feet if there is a good price going. 
how would the like of her get a good price for a pig? If the west wind holds with the last bit of the moon, let you and Nora get up weed enough for another cock for the kelp. Its hard set will be from this day, with no one in it but one man to work. Its hard set will be surely the day you drowned it with the rest. What way will I live with the girls with me, and I an old woman looking for the grave? Bartley lays down the halter, takes off his old coat, and puts on a newer one of the same flannel. Is she coming to the pier? She's passing the green head and letting fall her sails. I'll have half an hour to go down, and you'll see me coming again in two days or three days, or maybe in four days if the wind is bad. Isn't it a hard and cruel man won't hear a word from an old woman, and she holding him from the sea? It's the life of a young man to be going on the sea. And who would listen to an old woman with one thing and she saying it over? I must go now quickly. I'll ride down on the red mare and the gray pony will run behind me. The blessing of God on you. He goes out. He's God now. God spare us and we'll not see him again. He's gone now, and when the black night is fallen, I'll have no son left me in the world. Why wouldn't you give him your blessing? And he looking round in the door. Isn't it sorrow enough is on every one in this house without your sending him out with an unlucky word behind him and a hard word in his ear? Maria takes up the tongs and begins raking the fire aimlessly without looking round. You're taking the turf away from the cake. The Son of God, forgive us. Nora, we're after forgetting his bit of bread. When it's destroyed, he'll be going till dark night, after he eaten nothing since the sun went up. It's destroyed, he'll be surely. There's no sense left on any person in a house where an old woman will be talking forever. Kathleen cuts off some of the bread and rolls it in a cloth. Let you go down now to the spring well and give him this, and he pass him. You'll see him then, and the dark word will be broken, and you can say, God speed you. The way he'll be easy in his mind. Will I be in it as soon as himself? If you go now, quickly. It's hard, said I am, to walk. Give her the stick, Nora, or maybe she'll slip on the big stones. What stick? The stick Michael brought from Connemara. In the big world, the old people do be leaving things after them for their sons and children. But in this place, it is the young men do be leaving things behind for them that be old. She goes out slowly. Nora goes over to the ladder. Wait, Nora. Maybe she turned back quickly. She's not sorry, God help her. You wouldn't know the things she'd do. Is she gone round by the bush? She's gone now. Draw it down quickly, for the Lord knows when she'll be out of it again. Nora gets the bundle from the loft. The young priest said he'd be passing tomorrow. We might go down to speak to him below if it's Michael's they are, surely. Kathleen takes the bundle. Did he say which way they were found? Nora comes down the ladder. There were two men, says he and they rowing round with poteen before the cocks crowed, and the oar of one of them caught the body, and they pass in the black cliffs off in the north. Give me a knife, Nora. The strings perished with the salt water, and there's a black knot on it you wouldn't loosen in a week. I've heard tell it's a long way to Donegal. It is, surely. There was a man in here a while ago. The man sold us that knife. And he said, if you set off walking from the rocks beyond, it would be seven days you'd be in Donegal. What time would a man take? And he floating. Kathleen opens the bundle and takes out a bit of a stocking. They look at them eagerly. The Lord spare us, Nora. Isn't it a queer hard thing to say if it's his they are, surely? I'll get his shirt off the hook. That way we can put the one flannel on the other. He looks through some clothes hanging in the corner. It's not with them, Kathleen. And where will it be? 
I'm thinking Bartley put it on him in the morning, for his own shirt was heavy with the salt in it. There's a bit of a sleeve was of the same stuff. Give me that and it'll do. Laura brings it to her and they compare the flannel. It's the same stuff, Nora. But if it is itself, aren't there great rolls of it in the shops of Galway? And isn't it many other men may have a shirt of it as well as Michael himself? Nora has taken up the stocking and counted the stitches. It's Michael, Kathleen. It's Michael, God spare his soul. What will herself say when she hears this story? And Bartley on the sea? Kathleen takes the stocking. It's a plain stocking. It's the second one of the third pair I knitted. I put up three score stitches and I dropped four of them. Kathleen catch, counts the stitches. It's that number, isn't it? Ah, oh, Nora, isn't it a bitter thing to think of him floating that way to the far north and no one to keen him but the black hags that do be flying on the sea? And isn't it a pitiful thing when there's nothing left of a man who is a great rower and fisher but a bit of, bit of an old shirt and a plain stocking? Tell me, is her self coming, Nora? I hear a little sound on the path. She is, Kathleen. She's coming up to the door. Put these things away before she'll come in. Maybe it's easier she'll be after giving her blessing to Bartley. And we won't let on we've heard anything the time he's on the sea. Nora helps Kathleen to close the bundle. We'll put them here in the corner. They put them into a hole in the chimney corner. Kathleen goes back to the spinning wheel. Well, she see it was crying I was. Keep your back to the door, the way the light will not be on you. Nora sits down at the chimney corner with her back to the door. Mari comes in very slowly without looking at the girls and goes over to her stool at the other side of the fire. The cloth with the bread is still in her hand. The girls look at each other and Nora points to the bundle of bread. You did give him his bit of bread. Did you see him riding down? God, forgive you. Isn't it a better thing to raise your voice and tell what you've seen than to be making lamentation for a thing that's done? Did you see Bartley, I'm saying to you? My heart's broken from this day. Did you see Bartley? I've seen the fearfulest thing. God, forgive you. He's riding the mare now over the green head and the grey pony behind him. The grey pony behind him? What is it ails you at all? I've seen the fearfulest thing any person has seen since the day Bridie Dara seen the dead man with the child in his arms. What? They crouch down in front of the old woman at the fire. Tell us what it is you've seen. I went down to the spring well, and I stood there saying a prayer to myself. Then Bartley came along, and he riding on the red mare with the gray pony behind him. The son of God, spare us, Nora. What is it you seen? I seen Michael himself. You did not, mother. It wasn't Michael you seen, for his body is after being found in the far north, and he's got a clean burial by the grace of God. I'm seeing him this day, and he riding and galloping. Bartley came first on the red mare, and I tried to say, God speed you, but something choked the words in my throat. He went by quickly, and the blessing of God on you, says he. And I could say nothing. I looked up then, and I crying at the great pony. And there was Michael upon it, with fine clothes on him, and new shoes on his feet. It's destroyed we are from this day. It's destroyed, surely. Didn't the young priest say the Almighty God wouldn't leave her destitute with no son living? 
If so little the like of him knows the sea, partly will be lost now, and let you call on Amen and make me a good coffin out of the white boards, for I won't live after them. I've had a husband and a husband's father and six sons in this house, six fine men. Though it was a hard birth I had with every one of them, and they be come into the world, and some of them were found, and some of them were not found. But they're gone now, the lot of them. There was Stephen and Sean, who were lost in the great wind, and found over in the Bay of Gregory of the Golden Mouth, and carried up the two of them in one plague, and in by that door. The girls start as if they heard something through the door that is half open behind them. Did you hear that, Kathleen? Did you hear a noise in the northeast? There's someone after crying out by the seashore. It was Seamus and his father, and his own father again, were lost in the dark night, and not a stick or sign was seen of them when the sun went up. There was Patch, after was drowned out of a corrug that turned over. I was sitting there with Bartley and he and Baby lying on my two knees. And I seen two women and three women and four women coming in. And they crossing themselves and not saying a word. I looked out then and there were men coming after them and they holding a thing in the half of a red sail and the water dripping out of it. It was a dry day, Nora, and leaving a track to the door. She pauses again with her hand stretched out towards the door. It opens softly and old women begin, begin to come in, crossing themselves on the threshold and kneeling down in front of the stage with red petticoats over their heads. Is it Patch or Michael? Or what is it at all? Michael is after being found in the far north. And when he is found there, how could he be here in this place? There does be a power of young men floating round in the sea. And what way would they know if it was Michael they had or another man like him? For when a man is nine days in the sea, and the wind blowing. It's hard set his own mother would be to say what man was it. It's Michael, God spare him, for they're after sending us a bit of his clothes from the far north. She reaches out and hands Maria the clothes that belong to Michael. Maria stands up slowly and takes them into her hands. Nora looks out. They're carrying a thing among them. And there's water dripping out of it and leaving a track by the big stones. Is it Bartley it is? It is, surely. God rest his soul. Two younger women come in and pull out the table. Then men carry in the body of Bartley, laid on a plank, with a bit of sail over it, and lay it on the table. What way was he drowned? The grey pony knocked him into the sea, and he was washed out where there is great surf on the white rocks. Maria has gone over and knelt down at the head of the table. The women are keening softly and swaying themselves with a slow movement. Kathleen and Nora kneel at the other end of the table. The men kneel near the door. They're all gone now, and there isn't anything more the sea can do to me. I'll have no call now to be up crying and praying when the wind breaks from the south and you can hear the surf is in the east and the surf is in the west, making a great stir with the two noises and they hitting one on the other. I'll have no call now to be going down and getting holy water in the dark nights after sound and I won't care what way the wind, the sea is when the other women will be keening. Give me the holy water, Nora. There's a small sup still on the dresser. Nora gives it to her. 
Maria drops Michael's clothes across Bartley's feet and sprinkles the holy water over him. It isn't that I haven't prayed for you, Bartley, to the almighty God. It isn't that I haven't said prayers in the dark night till you wouldn't know what I will be saying. But it's a great rest I'll have now, and it's time, surely. It's a great rest I'll have now, and great sleeping in the long nights after sound, if it's only a bit of wet flour we do have to eat, and maybe a fish that would be stinking. She kneels down again, crossing herself, and saying prayers under her breath. Maybe yourself and Eamon would make a coffin when the sun rises. We have fine white boards herself bought, God help her, thinking Michael would be found. And I have a new cake you can eat while you'll be working. Are there nails with them? They are not, Colm. We didn't think of the nails. It's a great wonder she wouldn't think of the nails and all the coffins she's seen made already. It's getting old she is and broken. Mario stands up again very slowly and spreads out the pieces of Michael's clothes beside the body, sprinkling them with the last of the holy water. She's quiet now and easy, but the day Michael was drowned, you could hear her crying out from this to the spring well. It's fonder she was of Michael, and would anyone have thought that? An old woman will soon be tired with anything she will do, and isn't it nine days herself is after crying and keening and making great sorrow in the house? They're all together this time and the end is come. May the almighty God have mercy on Bartley's soul and on Michael's soul and on the souls of Seamus and Patch and Stephen and Sean. And may he have mercy on my soul, Nora and on the soul of everyone is left living in the world. She pauses, and the keen rises a little more loudly from the women, then sinks away. Michael has a clean burial in the far north by the grace of the Almighty God. Bartley will have a fine coffin out of the white boards and a deep grave, surely. What more can we want than that? No man at all can be living forever, and we must be satisfied. She kneels down again, and the curtain falls slowly. Trifles by Susan Glassbell. The kitchen is the now abandoned farmhouse of John Wright, a gloomy kitchen, and left without having been put in order. Unwashed pans under the sink, a loaf of bread outside the bed, bread box, a dish towel on the table, other signs of incompleted work. The sheriff comes in followed by the county attorney and Hale. All are much bundled up and go at once to the stove, they are followed by the two women who stand close together near the door. This feels good. Come up to the fire, ladies. I'm not cold. Now, uh, Mr. Hale, before we move things about, you uh, explain to Mr. Henderson just what you saw when you came here yesterday morning. By the way, has anything been moved or are things just as you left them yesterday? It's just the same. When it dropped below zero last night, I thought I'd better send Frank out this morning to make a fire for us. Uh, no sense us uh, getting the pneumonia with the big case on, but, but I told him not to touch anything except the stove, and, and you know Frank. Somebody should have been left here yesterday. Oh, yesterday. <laughs> when I had to send Frank to Morris Center for that man who went crazy. I want you to know I had my hands full yesterday. I knew you could get back from Omaha by today, and as long as I went over everything here myself. Well, Mr. Hale, just tell us what happened when you came here yesterday morning. Harry and I had started out to town with a load of potatoes. 
uh, we came along the road from my place, and as I got here, I said, I'm going to see if I can't get John Wright to go in with me on a party telephone. I spoke to Wright about it once before, and he put me off, saying folks talk too much anyway, and all he asked was peace and quiet. I guess you know how much he talked himself, but I thought maybe if I went to the house and talked about it before his wife, so I said to Harry, I didn't know this, what his wife wanted made much difference to John. Let's talk about that later, Mr. Hale. I do want to talk about that, but tell me now just what happened when you got to the house. I didn't hear or see anything. I knocked at the door, and still it was all quiet inside. I knew they must be up. It was past eight o'clock. So I knocked again, and I thought I heard somebody say, come in. I wasn't sure. I'm, I'm not sure yet, but I opened the door, this door, and there in the rocker sat Mrs. White. What was she doing? She was rocking back and forth. She had her, uh, her apron in her hand and was kind of pleating it. And how did she look? Well, she, uh, she looked queer. How do you mean queer? Well, as if she didn't know what she was going to do next and kind of done up. How did you seem to feel about your coming? Why, I don't think she minded one way or the other. She didn't pay much attention. I said, how do, Mrs. Wright, it's cold, ain't it? But she said, is it? And went on kind of pleating at her apron. Well, I was surprised. I, she didn't ask me to come up to the stove or to sit down, but just sat there, not even looking at me. So I said, I want to see John. And then she laughed. I guess you'd call it a laugh. I thought of Harry and the team outside. So I said a little sharp, can't I see John? No, she says, kind of dull, like. Ain't he home, says I? Yes, says she. she, he's home. Then why can't I see him? I asked her out of patience. Cause he's dead, says she. Dead, says I? She just nodded her head, not getting a bit excited, but rocking back and forth. Why, where is he, says I, not knowing what to say. She uh, just pointed upstairs uh, like that. I got up with the idea of going up, up there. I walked from there to here, and then I says, why, what did he die of? He died of a rope round his neck, says she. And she just went on pleating at her apron. Well, I went out and called Harry. I, I thought I might need help. We went upstairs. There he was, lying on the bed. I, I, I think I'd rather have you go into that upstairs. Uh, we could point it all out. Now, just, just go on with the rest of the story. My first thought was to get that rope off. It looked, uh, <laughs> but Harry, he went up to him and he said, no, he's dead all right, and we better not touch anything. So we went back downstairs and she was still sitting the same way. Has anybody been notified, I asked? No, she said, says she unconcerned. Who did this, Mrs. Wright, said Harry. He said it businesslike and she stopped pleating of her apron. I don't know, she says. You don't know, says Harry? No, says she. Weren't you sleeping in the bed with him, says Harry? Yes, says she, but I was on the inside. Somebody slipped a rope round his neck and strangled him, and you didn't wake up, says Harry. I didn't wake up, she said after him. We must have looked as if we didn't see how that could be, for after a minute, I, she said, I sleep sound. <laughs> Harry was going to ask her more questions, but I said, maybe we ought to let her tell her story first to the coroner or the sheriff. So Harry went fast and to, as he could to Rivers Place where there's a telephone. And what did Mrs. Wright do when she knew that you're going for the coroner? She moved from that chair to this one over here and just sat there with her hands held together and looking down. I got a feeling that I ought to make some conversation. So I said, I had come in to see if John wanted to put in a telephone. And at that, she started to laugh and she stopped and looked at me scared. I don't know, maybe it wasn't scared. I, I wouldn't like to say what it was. But soon Harry got back and then Dr. Lloyd came and you and Mr. Peter. So I, I guess that's all I know that you don't. I guess we'll go upstairs first and then out to the barn and around there. You're convinced that there was nothing important here, nothing that would point to any motive. Nothing here but uh, kitchen things. The county attorney, after again looking around the kitchen, opens the door of a cupboard closet. 
He gets up on a chair and looks on a shelf, pulls his hand away, sticky. Here's a nice mess. Oh, her fruit. Did it freeze? She worried about that when it turned so cold. She said the fire would go out and her jars would break. <laughs> Can you beat the women? Held for murder and worrying about her preserves. I guess before we're through, she'll have something more than serious than preserves to worry about. Well, women are used to wor worrying over trifles. Hmm. And yet for all their worries, what would we do without the ladies? goes to the sink, takes a dipper full of water from the pail, and pouring it into a basin, washes his hands, starts to wipe them on the roller towel, turns it for a cleaner place. Dirty towels. Kicks his foot against the pans under the sink. Not much of a housekeeper, would you, housekeeper, would you say, ladies? There's a great deal of work to be done on a farm. <laughs> to be sure, and yet I know there are some Dixon County farmhouses, which do not have such roller towels. Well, those towels get dirty awful quick. Men's hands aren't always as clean as they might be. Ah, loyal to your sex, I see. But you and Mrs. Wright were neighbors. I suppose you were friends too. Oh, I I've not seen much of her of late years. I've not been to this house in, oh, it's more than a year. And why was that? You didn't like her? Oh, I liked her well enough. Farmers' wives have their hands full, Mr. Henderson. And then... Yes? It never seemed a very cheerful place. No, it's not cheerful. I should say she had the homemaking instinct. Well, I don't know as Wright had either. You mean they didn't get on very well? No, I, I don't mean anything. But I don't think a place would be any cheerfuller for John Wright's being in it. Mm. I'd like to talk more of that a little later. I want to get the lay of things upstairs now. I suppose anything Mrs. Peters does will be all right. She was in to take some closing for her, you know, and a few little things. We left in such a hurry yesterday. Yes, but I'd like to see what you take, Mrs. Peters, and keep an eye out for anything that might be of use to us. Yes, Mr. Henderson. The women listen to the men's steps on the stairs, then look about the kitchen. Oh, I'd hate to have men coming into my kitchen, snooping around and criticizing. She arranges the pans under sink, which the lawyer had shoved out of place. Oh, of course, it's no more than their duty. Well, duty's all right, but I guess that deputy sheriff that came out to make the fire might have got a little of this on. She gives the roller towel a pull. Wish I'd thought of that sooner. Seems mean to talk about her for not having things slicked up when she had to come away in such a hurry. Mrs. Peters lifts one end of a towel that covers a pan. She had bread set. Mrs. Hale looks a loaf of bread beside the bread box at the other side of the room and moves slowly toward it. She was going to put this in there. He picks up loaf, then abruptly drops it. Oh, it's a shame about her fruit. I wonder if it's all gone. She gets up on the chair and looks. Oh, I, I think there's some here that's all right, Mrs. Peters. Yes, here. Well, I, I declare, I, I believe that's the only one. She gets She'll feel awful bad after all her hard work in the hot weather. I remember the afternoon I put up my cherries last summer. She goes to the sink and wipes it off on the outside. She puts the bottle in the big kitchen table, center of the room. Well, I must get those things from the front room closet. You coming with me, Mrs. Hale? You could help me carry them. They go in the other room, reappear Mrs. Peters carrying a dress and skirt, Mrs. Hale following with a pair of shoes. Oh my, it's cold in there. She puts the clothes on the big table and hurries to the stove. Right was close. I think maybe that's why she kept so much to herself. She didn't even belong to the ladies' aid. I suppose she felt she couldn't do her part, and then you don't enjoy do doing things when you feel shabby. 
she used to wear pretty clothes and be lively when she was Minnie Foster, one of the town girls singing in the choir. But that, oh, that was 30 years ago. This all you was to take in? She said she wanted an apron. Funny thing to want, for there isn't much to get you dirty in jail, goodness knows. But I suppose just to make her feel more natural. She said they was in the top drawer in the cupboard. Oh, yes, here. And then her little shawl that's always behind the door. He opens stair door and looks. Yes, here it is. He quickly shuts door leading upstairs. Mrs. Peters? Yes, Mrs. Hale. Do you think she did it? Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't think she did. Asking for an apron and her little shawl, worrying about her fruit. Footsteps are heard in the room above. <sighs> Mr. Peters says it looks bad for her. Mr. Henderson is awful sarcastic in a speech and, and he'll make fun of her saying she didn't wake up. Well, I guess John Wright didn't wake up when they were slipping that rope under his neck. No, oh, it's strange. It must have been done awful crafty and still. They say it was such a funny way to kill a man, rigging it all up like that. That's just what Mr. Hale said. There was a gun in the house. That's what he can't understand. Mr. Henderson said coming out that was needed. What was needed for the case was a motive, something to show anger or, or sudden feeling. Well, I don't see any signs of anger around here. She puts her hand on the dish towel, which lies on the table, stands looking down at table, one half of which is clean, the other half messy. It's wiped to here. Makes a move as if to finish work, then turns and looks at the loaf of bread outside the bread box. Drops towel. Wonder how they're finding things upstairs. I hope she had it a little more read up up there. You know, it seems kind of sneaking, locking her up in town and then coming out here and trying to get her own house to turn against her. But Mrs. Hale, the law is the law. Well, I suppose it is. Oh, better loosen up your things, Mrs. Peters. You won't feel them when you go out. Mrs. Peters stands looking at the under part of the small corner table. She was uh, piecing a quilt. She brings the large sewing basket and they look at the bright pieces. Oh, it's log cavern pattern. Pretty, isn't it? I wonder if she was going to quilt it or just knot it. <laughs> They wonder if she was going to quilt it or just knot it. Frank's fired a new. Uh, Frank's fired a new much up there, didn't it? Well, let's go out to the barn and get that cleared up. The men go outside. I don't know if there's anything so strange or taking up our time with little things while we're waiting for them to get the evidence. She sits down. I don't see if it's anything to laugh about. Of course, they've got awful important things on their minds. She pulls up a chair and joins Mrs. Hale at the table. Mrs. Peters, look at this one. Here, th th this is the one she was working on and look at the sewing. All the rest of it has been nice and even and look at this. It's all over the place. It, it, why, it looks as if she didn't know what she was about. They look at each other, then start to glance back at the door. After an instant, Mrs. Hale has pulled it in a knot and ripped the sewing. Oh, what are you doing, Mrs. Hale? Just pulling out a stitch or two that's not sewed very good. Bad sewing always makes me fidgety. Well, I don't think we ought to touch things. Uh, I'll just finish up this end. Mrs. Peters? Yes, Mrs. Hale. What do you suppose she was so nervous about? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. And she was nervous. I, I sometimes so awful queer when I'm just tired. Oh. Well, I must get these things wrapped up. They may be through sooner than we think. I wonder where I can find a piece of paper and string. Oh, uh, in that cupboard, maybe? Right. Here's a bird cage. Did she have a bird, Mrs. Hale? Oh, I, I don't know whether she did or not. I, I've not been here for so long. There was a man around last year selling canaries cheap, but I, I don't know if she took one. Maybe she did. 
She used to sing real pretty herself. Seems funny uh, to think of a bird here, but she must have had one or why would she have a cage? I wonder what happened to it. I suppose maybe the cat got it. Oh no, she didn't have a cat. She's got that feeling some people have about cats being afraid of them. My cat got in her room and she was real upset and asked me to take it out. Oh, my sister Bessie was like that. Queer, ain't it? Why, look at this door. It's, it's broke, one hinge is pulled apart. Oh, looks as if someone must have been rough with it. I guess. Brings the cage forward and puts it on the table. I, I wish if they're going to find any evidence, they'd be about it. I don't like this place. But I'm awful glad you came with me, Mrs. Hale. It would be lonesome for me sitting here alone. No, oh, it would, wouldn't it? But I tell you what I do wish, Mrs. Peters. I wish I had come over here sometimes when she was here. I wish I had. But of course, you were awful busy, Mrs. Hale. Your house and your children. I could have come. I stayed away because it weren't cheerful, but that's why I ought to have come. I've never liked this place. Maybe because it's down in a hollow and you don't see it from the road. I don't know what it is, but it's a lonesome place and always was. I wish I'd come over to see Minnie Foster sometimes. I, I can see now. Now you mustn't reproach yourself, Mrs. Hale. Somehow we just don't see how it is with other folks until something comes up. Not having children makes less work, but it makes a quiet house and ride out to work all day and no company when he did come in. Did you know John Wright, Mrs. Peters? Oh, not to know him. I've seen him in town. They say he was a good man. Yes, good. He, he didn't drink and kept his word as well as most, I guess, and paid his debts. But he was a hard man, Mrs. Peters. Oh, just to pass the time of day with him, like a raw wind that gets it to the bone. I should think she'd have wanted a bird. But what do you suppose went with it? I don't know. Unless it got sick and died. She reaches over and swings the broken door, swings it again. Both women watch it. You weren't raised around here, were you? You didn't know her? Not till they brought her yesterday. She, come to think of it, she was kind of like a bird herself. Real sweet and pretty and the kind of timid and fluttery. How she did change. Tell you what, Mrs. Peters, why don't you take the quilt in with you? It might take up her mind. I think that's a real nice idea, Mrs. Hale. There couldn't possibly be any objections to it, could there? No. Now, now, just what would I take? I, I wonder if her patches are in here and, and her things. They look in the sewing basket. Oh, here's some red. Oh, I expect this has some, got some sewing things in it. Oh, what a pretty box. Looks like it's something, it's something someone would give you. Maybe, maybe her scissors are in here. Why, why, Mrs. Peters, there's, there's something wrapped up in, in, in this piece of silk. Why, this isn't her scissors. Oh, Mrs. Peters, it's, it's the bird. But Mrs. Peters, look at it. it. It's neck. Look at its neck. It's all other side too. Somebody wrung its neck. Their eyes meet. A look of growing comprehension of horror. Steps are heard outside. Mrs. Hale slips the box under quilt pieces and sinks into her chair. The sheriff and county attorney enter. Mrs. Peters rises. Well, ladies, have you decided whether she was going to quilt it or knot it? We think she was going to knot it. Well, that's interesting, I'm sure. Uh, has the bird flown? Mrs. Hale puts more quilt pieces over the box. We, we think the cat got it. Is there a cat? Well, not now. They're superstitious, you know. They, they leave. 
No sign of it at all, or anyone having come from the outside. Their own rope. Now let's go up again and uh, go over it piece by piece. There'd have to have been someone who knew just the... They go upstairs. Mrs. Peters sits down. The two women sit there, not looking at one another, but as if peering into something and at the same time holding back. She liked the bird. She was going to bury it in that pretty box. When I was a girl, my kitten, there, there was a boy took a hatchet and, and before my eyes and before I could get there, if they hadn't held me back, I would have hurt him. I wonder how it would seem never to have had any children around. No, Wright wouldn't like the bird, a thing that sang. She used to sing. He killed that too. We don't know who killed the bird. I knew John Wright. It was an awful thing was done in this house that night, Mrs. Ale. Killing a man while he slept, slipping a rope around his neck that choked his life out of him. His neck choked the life out of him. We Her don't head out and rests on the birdcage. We don't know who killed him. We don't know. If there had been years and years of nothing, and then a bird to sing to you, it would be awful still, after the bird was still. I know what stillness is. When we homesteaded in Dakota and my first baby died after he was two years old and me with no other then. How soon do you suppose they'll be through looking for the evidence? I know what stillness is. I wish you'd seen The Minnie. law has got to punish crime, Mrs. Hale. I wish you'd seen Minnie Foster when she wore a white dress with blue ribbons and stood up there in the choir and sang. Oh, I wish I had come over here once in a while. That was a crime. That was a crime. Who's going to punish that? We mustn't take on, Mrs. Hale. I might have known she needed help. I know how things can be for women. I tell you, it's queer, Mrs. Peters. We live close together and we live far apart. We all go through the same things. It, it's just a different kind of the same thing. Brushes her eyes, she notices the bottle of fruit reaches out for it. If I was you, I, I, I wouldn't tell her her fruit was gone. Tell her it ain't. Tell her it's all right. T take this in to prove it to her. She may never know whether it was broke or not. Mrs. Peters takes the bottle, looks around for something to wrap it in, takes petticoat from the clothes brought from the other room, very nervously begins winding this around the bottle. My, it's a good thing the men couldn't hear us. Wouldn't they just laugh, getting all stirred up over a little thing like a dead canary? As if that could have anything to do with, with, <laughs> wouldn't they laugh? The men are heard coming down the stairs. Maybe they would. Maybe they wouldn't. No, Peters, it's all perfectly clear, except the reason for doing it. But you know juries when it comes to women. If there was some definite thing, Something to show, something to make a story about, a thing that would connect up with the this strange way of doing it. The women's eyes meet for an instant. Well, I've got the team around. Uh, pretty cold out there. I'm going to stay here for a while by myself. Uh, you can send Frank after me, can't you? I want to go over everything. I'm not satisfied that we can't do better. Do you want to see what Mrs. Peters is going to bring in? Oh, I guess they're uh, not very dangerous things the ladies have picked out. He moves a few things about disturbing the quilt pieces which cover the box. No, Mrs. Peters doesn't uh, need supervising. For that matter, a sheriff's wife is married to the law. Ever think of it that way, Mrs. Peters? Not just that way. Married to the law. <laughs> hey, I want you to come in here a minute, George. We ought to... Take a look at these windows. Ah, windows. We'll be right out, Mr. Hale. 
Hale goes outside. The sheriff follows the county attorney into the other room. Then Mrs. Hale rises, hands tight together, looks intensely at Mrs. Peters, whose eyes make a slow turn, finally meeting Mrs. Hale's. Mrs. Hale's eyes point the way to where the box is concealed. Suddenly, Mrs. Peters throws back quilt pieces and tries to put the box in the bag she's wearing. It's too big. She opens box, starts to take bird out, cannot touch it, goes to pieces and stands there helpless. There's the sound of a knob turning in the other room. Mrs. Hale snatches the box and puts it in the pocket of her big coat. The county attorney and sheriff enter. Well, Henry, at least we found out that she was not going to quilt it. She was going to, what do you call it, ladies? We call it not it, Mr. Henderson. Curtain. 